Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mastery Us. We're happy to have you here for another Meet the Mentor event. I am Judith Hakala, your host for today's session. I am a member and navigator at Mastery Us, which is an online platform connecting artists with mentors who support us on our journey wherever we are coming from aspiring to emerging to accomplished. Mastery is, is a non-competitive platform that truly fosters collaboration, growth, and community. And today's event is an opportunity for us to hear about Lauren Manticon's practice and her upcoming mentorship group, which begins on Monday, the 24th of June at 11 o'clock Mountain Time and it will continue monthly on the fourth Monday of the month thereafter. I am very pleased to introduce Lauren Manticon, who is a returning Mastrius mentor. Lauren is an artist and mentor based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Lauren's lifelong studies of metaphysics psycho-spirituality, and her fascination with the inexplicable mysteries of life currently inform her work. Symbols of veils, mists, orbs, black holes, string-like pearls, abstracted landscapes, and ghost vessels are her lay motif. <laughs> Lauren has presented solo shows and participated in group exhibitions in galleries and museums throughout the U.S. and Mexico. She has completed numerous art residencies and her work is gallery represented and in many notable private collections. Lauren's formal education includes a Bachelor of Arts from California State University and followed by a Master of Fine Arts in Painting at Portland State University in Oregon. Her CV is very impressive and lengthy. Enjoy it when you look at it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would like to turn this over to you, Lauren, and first off, say welcome. I'm so happy that you're here to talk about your mentorship group and um, your art practice. And if there's something that you would like to add to the introduction about you or the bio, uh, please feel free to do that. And I thought what you did was really wonderful. Thank you for that you're intro. You're very welcome. And yep. all you, Lauren. So uh, what I'm going to do here is tell you a little bit about me and my own inspirations. Hi, everybody. Hello. And I'm going to slowly give you a tour to show you a body of work. Most of them are here that I just completed of large scale works that I'm calling arcs, angels, arcs and angels. Um, and then I'm gonna do a short demo of how I enter a painting. You know, over the last, I'm gonna say a couple of decades, I've been offering what I call the alchemy of mixed media. I have my master's in painting and quite frankly, everybody, I, I really feel that what we have offered to us that we don't need to do that academic route so much anymore. And if anything, the more authentic we can be, the better. And I don't know about you, but I'm gonna tell you, when I got out of graduate school, I spent about 10 years unlearning all those voices because I went to school at a time when it was all primarily ego-based, meaning my students are gonna paint like me. And you know, of course, you're a masterious that it's more about fostering that individual. And I like to take that as deep as we can go. And what I mean by this is we often think if we're returning to art after not doing it for a long time and want to now pursue a career, or if we're just beginners because we're just dabbling, oh, what would it mean to be an artist? That one of the most important things we can do is to really listen to our own inspirations mm -hmm. because we can learn a whole bunch of techniques 
And then that's what we have. And it keeps everything, oh, it's just good enough. But there's always, I feel, because I've seen it over and over of 20 years of mentoring, this inkling inside where you know you might not be making your work, right? So what I do, and I call it the alchemy of mixed media, because I'm interested in you as an individual, and I have taught in academia for years, color theory, drawing, painting, those basics. And yes, they're important, but we do a lot of idea generating that I've developed over the course of many, many years to get to that place of your own inspiration. Because at a graduate school, kind of circling back with what I was saying, I would have my instructor's voices. I would have who we were looking at as contemporary artists. I was uh, trying to appropriate copy and, and put it into my own work. And it was very dissatisfying that finally at some point, we all, all of us as artists, me working 30 years, it still bubbles up where I have to reinvent myself again of what are my interests now? Am I painting things from the past or am I bringing it forward? So what we're going to be doing is really, if you're a quirky artist, then I want to nurture that. If you are really serious about your skills and techniques, I want to nurture that to the best of my ability because having done this so long, I have so many tricks of mixed media techniques under my belt that I, it would just be so overwhelming. So as I hone in on all our idea generating that we do once a month and I provide creative visualizations that I have a plethora of on my YouTube channel and some that are private that I will send to you to get us into what a symbol is if you're an abstract artist, you don't have to be stuck in, I must paint abstract. What happens if representation is starting to creep in? You're like, oh, no, no, no. I say, invite that in because you never know how that's going to merge because that's going to be part of your individual voice. So alchemy is internal as much as it is external. That alchemy of turning I could name my inspiration and we've all seen this. We'll walk into a gallery and we'll read their statement and it will say, I am, I am influenced and inspired by nature. That didn't tell us much, did it? I'm, I'm influenced and inspired by houses, architecture, you know, fill in the blank. What we're going to do is I have a way because I've developed this over time. I get so excited about it. I have a way of working out, okay, so you come with a name. I'm an abstract painter and I love red. And then we're gonna be doing some writing and visual simultaneously so you can build a deeper relationship with the work you make. And that's what we want, right? The intimacy, because what happens is we start on our art journey and then we hit some roadblocks, like I have no idea what I'm doing, which is actually a good thing because creativity is born out of chaos. But there's always a third thing, a third thing, just like with your husband or your mother or your daughter, you have you, you have your daughter, and then you have the third thing. So what we want is to get really clear on that third thing that's being developed as you're doing your art practice. So it is soul. It's and we're all wanting to be artists because we want to express our soul. So I do it a little backwards, you know, a little experimenting wildly with the with the idea generating, and then from there you'll be making pieces. So when when you come to let's say beginning with me, we we will be doing quite a bit of that, a lot of idea generating. And then over the course of the weeks, it develops into pieces. I'm not, I'll give you a, a list of materials, but if you prefer working on wood, then work on wood. If you prefer working on paper, then work on paper. If you prefer canvas, then work on canvas. If you don't know what that is, then I'm really gonna recommend you get a canvas, you get some 
quality paper. I happen to use either a uh, 250 pound or 300 pound watercolor or printmaking paper, which seems to work really well, which I have taped back here. And that way you'll be experimenting with all three. So by the end of the, end of the uh, sessions, you'll be able to name and you'll probably be able to name why you like paper. I used to not like working on canvas because it was too bouncy bouncy for me. I wanted the wood. And then when I lived in Portland, Oregon for 20 years and I would, I would make my own wood panels. And then I moved to the Southwest where wherever wood's being delivered from, it would shrink and I noticed it was warping more. So I started using what are called hollow doors. So I go, to, so it's double panel. And you can go to a um, door shop. <laughs> yeah, you are a door shop, literally, like people that do birch doors, untreated wood, and I have them cut it down and fill it in. So that's that's completely unconventional, but I'm just giving you a little tidbit of what I prefer to use. And I also like to use paper. So back to inspiration. What I wanna say about that, is I can talk about my own personal journey. And for me, spirituality and metaphysics were of an interest of mine at such an early age, like 15, 16. I just, I couldn't get enough of just reading about reincarnation and started with astrology. My mother was an astrologer and a Jungian therapist. So I was, I, I became interested in soul. And this is, something that I'm sharing that I didn't used to share, but I realized that I am interested in painting that in-between space of life and death. What is that crossover? And what I'm about to share is ever since I was young, when someone close to me was dying or I didn't know they had died, they come to me in a dream. Mm -hmm. So, and then it started happening with people that I didn't really know. And I, I didn't know it because it was unconscious, but I think my moving into painting became a way to have portals entered. So maybe I could assist in um, spirits that are passing or to just describe the ineffable. What is that liminal space? So I've always had this interest and the work, the materials over the course of like three decades have changed, but my core value and why I paint has not. And it's not like you have to name it now, but what I really want is to have you walk away of, I'm really interested in landscape and this is why. You know, because so I might ask, I paint landscape. Well, what do you mean by landscape? Judith, what might you say? Like, if I ask that, what do you mean by like going a little deeper? Judith, what do you paint? I do paint landscapes and it's through my point of view of the, the feeling more than the actual you know, elements of the landscape. It's how I connected to the atmosphere, the colors, the air, the smells, everything. It's not so much about the detail. It's more about how I experienced it. Yeah. So it's like sense of place, taking in the visceral, right? And Absolutely. then, and then I would start naming for all of you out there that connect to that sense of place, there's ways in our bodies to, to like connect to what it is. Like I might say to you, Judith, where do you feel that? Like when you're connecting to a place you grew up in and you want to paint that, is it in your belly? Is it in your throat? Is it in your head? Cause those are all clues. And often there's colors that take over one more than the other. I mean, intuition, it can seem so elusive, but it really isn't when you start naming, really naming the what, the why, and the how I call it. What are you making? How are you making it? Why are you making it? And if you're a beginner, you can even do this with your beginning work. 
So don't think, you, you know, this is outside of the box because this is all part of the experimentation. And I will be doing demos throughout the course of those four weeks. I'm going to feel into like what the group might want. Um, I work any, I work with acrylic and I work in oil and I work in dry mediums. I'll often end with cold wax. I've worked in encaustic when I think a piece needs it. Ah, collage, which I'm going to do a little tour now. And does anybody have any questions of what I said so far? Uh, <laughs> I am excited and I, I want to see more and hear more. Um, and I, Irene, thank you for joining us. And do you have any questions thus far? Please feel free to chime in. Okay, this is, if Irene wants to, hi, Irene. Oh, hi, hi I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine, it's fine. I, I'm with you and um, I'm looking forward to your demo. Thanks. You're welcome. My demo is going to be a way to enter into a painting, keeping it raw and keeping it simple and looking for the clues. Okay, so just to give you a short rundown of my Santa Fe studio. Enjoying the video? Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when new Masteries videos are added. Uh, this painting over here is in oil. I call it flight. And, I, and I'm a painter that does many layers. You know, you can kind of see them in here. And I'm not somebody who thinks, oh, I spent so much time on this. I must make it work. If it's not working, I start not covering it to start over. But what I do is I add, and I'll, do, I'll probably do that in the demo. This one's called Visions of Lumeria. Let's see if you can see it. Yes. So there's a ghost vessel down in there. I, I tend to paint a lot of ghost vessels. This is Luca the dog. <laughs> Hi, Luca. <laughs> yes. And I love this painting. It's called Duende. Duende with Luca. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, I love it too. So you can see the wings in here as well. I started working with geometrical shapes um, not too long ago. I was working very much, if you look at some of my past work with atmosphere, and I just wanted a structure that represented earth with a little bit of atmosphere that represented spirit. And then I've gone down a rabbit hole with quantum physics and, uh, and string theory and what sacred geometry might mean. So this one's called a flash of beauty. I think they're showing up backwards on the screen, which is really interesting to me. This one is my problem child. Not done yet, everybody has one. <laughs> and if you don't, you're lying to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> There's always one. Um, this one's called through a rock and a portal. And then, you know, I have simultaneously um, some collage work with painting. I had one of my dogs that kind of looked like Luca who died. His name was Rudy. And this is his, this is his memorial piece. It's called the Rainbow Bridge. So it's a combination of materials. And in, in the class, and you, you all might be already learning this, it's really not easy if you are working in oil paint to do collage on top. That's why I do all my dry materials first. This is all collage and this is oil paint up here. And when you're really mixing materials, you gotta kind of know, you know, uh-oh, where's the oil? Because once oil goes down, you got an oil painting. Yeah. That's just the way it is. But we'll primarily be working in acrylic unless some of you are really working in oil. I am open to the materials that you're using or the ones that you're really interested in using. And if I know about them, I'm here to mentor you with those. Wonderful. Just want you to know that because usually over all these years, there's, well, I always come up to something where if I don't know, I don't know, but 
there's quite a bit. Handmade gessos, which I love to paint with, by the way, by throwing dry pigment into the handmade gesso because you get such a wonderful chalky quality and then water fixates it. So here's another one in progress with the collage. Yeah. Oh, and no. here's another one I started. Who knows where this will go? I've got the tape around it because it's on raw canvas. That's my studio tour. Anybody have a question for me on that? Hope you didn't oh. get busy. I want to be there with a fresh cup of coffee. <laughs> mm. All right. So I like to call this mucking about that when we have a blank surface and we're not sure really what it's going to be or how do I start? We take for granted. Can everybody see me okay? Sure we can. We take for granted some of these sheets that we buy in the art supply store. And I really love to start by closing one's eyes and feeling the size. Do you want it to be a rectangle or do you want it to be vertical or horizontal. I personally love the square. So I just, and then I rip my paper. I always give it a border. As you can see, um, the one that I put up, I put up with blue tape and I give it a border. So when you pull, when you pull off, you've got this nice border around it. Now this is mixed media. This has a cold wax. This has um, collage and oil paint built up over time. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. So it's got acrylic and then the oil came last. I also like to use a pencil and um, scribble in there. Yeah. And then, Here's one of just entering in that I just began yesterday, like for a demo. And when I say muck about, I really do mean muck about. So here we go. The first thing, I put this on it as a square. The squares are the hardest to work with. And you might all know this, and um, they're the most challenging. And that is because you don't have a sense of gravity. Cognitively, when we take in a rectangle, if it's, if it's horizontal, we see landscape. It's it's um, it's just the way that we do a gestalt. We see ovals and we think head. We see vertical and it could be like, oh, that's gonna be a person or straight up. When you do the square, you don't have the gravity set up for you of dropping or long that it can be more challenging compositionally. So I like to challenge myself um, and do the square. And I usually start, no, I don't usually, I start just to get myself in there with pastel. So I pulled out a few, this one's a thicker one. That one's just a more inexpensive one. And I'll say, make a mark, any mark. You know what? Just that mark can give you so much information. You stand back. I did it right in the middle. I made it vertical. I didn't do it down here. I did now. Okay, so make marked. I like to uh, water fixates pastel. So I like to paint with it for a while. Just mucking about because we're building up our surface, especially you abstract painters. I believe that every layer holds a history. Mm -hmm. That it's not it's not so linear. So if I've got the freedom to really scribble, I'm also a fan of the drip. 
I mean, you could think about your colors, but as when you're first going in, I think just the idea of intuitively feeling a color and having all your colors out beforehand. So you're not running around trying to find, this is just water spray bottle makes those drips. There's something in here I like. You stand back and you're like, hmm, where is it going? If you don't know, you just keep going. So for me, I've just got some raw umber here, inexpensive. I usually start with my inexpensive paints and then maybe move into golden acrylic because it has more pigment in it. Um, but if I'm just doing my underlayer underpaintings, doesn't matter. And sometimes I just, <laughs> right now it's all wet, but I can come in with one of these silicone scrapers. I keep working like this till the painting starts to talk to me, which isn't at this moment. These are great. Also, my big go-to are baby wipes. I all of a sudden have an urge to just kind of take some of this paint off so I can get some white on there. Let's say you don't like any of it, right? You can keep using these materials over and over. And what I mean by that is I can get my painting wet. I can work it with acrylic. It can dry and I can go back again with my um, pastels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make a bad painting. All I, I'm just trying to get myself in in like what do you want to be and at, you know at the same time maybe create a little atmosphere like i'm liking that um i have a question i i noticed that a lot of mixed media artists use pastels i don't can you talk about why that's useful or helpful well it, mixed media artists will use pastels because it is a dry pigment and it can be quite natural in many ways because once you get the plastic down, which is acrylic, then then you're just really kind of working the plastic. I like how the, how do I say it? I like the the way it feels. You know, sometimes it's not about what it looks like in the end. Materials are, how do they feel in your hand? Yeah. You know, and for me, it, it's, it's personal. So I think it's, I think, I think Irene, that's really subjective. You know, um, I can see, I can come in and draw, which is really sometimes easier for me than coming in with a paintbrush. And then I can smear it. Is it, you might look at it and go, well, that's no different than paint, but when you're in it, it is different. Does that make sense? What I'm, what I'm saying and sharing? Um, yes. Um, now do you need to use fixative on top of that? Not if you're, not if you're painting. Water fixates it. All I gotta do is that and give it a few minutes and it, whatever you put on top, Whatever you put on top is going to usually not smear. I mean, if you're really not wanting your lines to smear, then you're going to need to go outside and use a fixative. Okay, thank you. For sure, yeah. And the other thing I like to do, I mean, that's pretty darn thick, is if it's all wet, I can come back in and... Let's say I just want to keep some of it, right? Like I'm still just making a mess, waiting for it to tell me something. Oh, that is so cool. <laughs> I have never used my shop towels that way. 
can't oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite things to do is to use my shop towel that way. It's got some nice atmosphere, actually, and I can carve back into it. Ask me more, ask me more. It's just called how to enter paint. Then you could come back and take away. Reductive is just as important as your additive. These are where my baby wipes just become my, my friend. Mm -hmm. So you just want random uh, white from your paper to be available to you or available to the piece. You, what, you mean why I'm doing this? Why I'm wiping it away? Yes. Yeah, all of a sudden, I'm my thought process as I'm I'm working is, oh, maybe I'll do these as connectors. You know, maybe maybe they can come in and maybe I can start to develop something by taking paint. There's already a, a dynamic there when you connect them. Wow. Yeah. You know, but what's happening for me compositionally is I'm distracted by these edges. So what I'm thinking as I'm talking to you is I want to come back with that darker color, maybe even green around the edges. So what do you do if you need to blend? What I do is I have more than one brush. I have what I call the dry brush. So that's pretty thick in paint. So let me go ahead and take some of it away. And then I'll go get a dry brush and, see, and show you some blending. I really put that on there. <laughs> so I have two in my hand. And so I, I might go into the painting and then with another brush that doesn't have paint on it. And I spend a lot of time taking paint off. I'm kind of an OCD person of blending. Um, if you look at my paintings, there's a lot of blending. And so, you know, it might be one way where I didn't, over time, I wasn't sure what I was doing as I was learning how to paint. Wasn't sure, wasn't sure. And I would just blend, take away, blend, take away. And you know what happens over time? If you're doing that for years, it becomes part of your signature. And so mm -hmm. you all have a signature. It's just, how do you find it? And I think one of the only ways to find it is to be willing to F up a painting. You've got it. <laughs> I mean, we don't, we all wanna be masters right away because sometimes we think we're running out of time, but I'm, I'm here to say the best studio practice at first is a closed studio door so you can experiment and experiment and not show your husband or your spouse or post it on social media because you know what happens? Someone says, oh my God, I really like that. And then you start painting like that. Not, you've just yeah. lost your train of thought of what your voice is. Mm -hmm. So I'm spending a, quite a bit of time here at this point, wiping off the brushes as I take off the paint and I call it licking, licking. That's a blending technique. And if you're in acrylic, you got to do it quick. I'm in the Southwest, so you can imagine how fast this acrylic paint dries in the desert, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. But you can always take your pesky spray bottle. So to answer, I mean, your, the question more of why pastel, it's a great way to enter into a painting just you can work quickly you can gesture and it's really sometimes about the gesture just moving things around because you have to wait for the paint to dry sometimes 
when you are when you're working with the acrylic and you're trying to muck around to see what the painting says and then it gets to a point where you're in relationship with the painting meaning and well I talk a lot about this in in um my teaching practice that you get to a point of learning how to really listen to what the painting wants just as much as you that third thing that third relationship yes So at this point, it's starting to dry, so I can just keep taking paint off, moving it around, blending it in. You know, it's now I've got something to work with. Now, let's just say I don't like it. You're still mucking up, right? Water bottle, it's not completely. And then I might say to you all, I wish I wouldn't have done that, but <laughs> hey, it's just a painting. That's right. Just a painting. Um, Maybe we'll put up this one so I don't have to look at that one. I love that you tape your papers too. I do. And it is just, it's so satisfying peeling off the tape. <laughs> Isn't it? I live for that. <laughs> Uh, let me, uh, Irene, I want, I wanted to ask you another question of, um, when you said I don't work in pastels, is there a reason? Is it just cause you've never tried it? It's not like you have to, there are no rules. There are no rules ever. I, um, I really believe this. There are guidelines. Yeah. I just, um, uh, never, never tried it. And I'm trying to keep the amount of materials I buy to a minimum. <laughs> right. You right. can get a really cheap um, pastel set for like $8 and okay. just, just to experiment. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just, just to see if that works at the beginning. Do you work in acrylic? I do. I I love it. <laughs> what do you paint? Well, uh, I moved towards more abstract painting and what I'm working on now is I'm working with old black and white historical photographs and um, interpreting them in an abstract way. So what's that middle process? When you look at the photo, do you use it as a memory? Like I'm gonna look, 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 not look, and then paint it so only the essentials come out? Um, yes, I, I have done that. Yes. And I've been very happy with the result. Oh, good. Good. That's not, that's wonderful. So you are talking a little bit about what Judith was saying at the beginning of that visceral component of feeling a sense of um, place. Yeah. It, uh, I, I resonate a lot with what Irene is saying too. And I, I did start using uh, pastels to start my work and I have a, a very inexpensive set. And like Lauren uh, was saying during her demo, you know, I use all my inexpensive stuff first when I'm layering. I mean, yes, we accumulate and over yes. time we learn how to use that. The pastel for me, um, has been wonderful and I love how it can even blend into the paint that I lay yes. down with it. Um, something else that similar thought process. And again, it is, it's that process. It's that I, I know what I'm doing. I'm beginning. And right. I also will use large pieces of charcoal or uh, vine charcoal to make a mark. Yes. Yes. Yes, yeah. to get started. It depends. It I just... sometimes, yeah, I think with the idea generating exercises that I have everybody doing and then honing in on one image and taking that image as far as they can, that sometimes even the imagery itself could be like, let me do this one in acrylic. Let me, let me now try it in collage where you're just cutting up the shapes. And now let me try it in pastel. 
And now let me try them all together. That can teach us so much as well. Yeah. yeah but I, I really feel that, uh, that it's so important to make this muck up, to like throw everything in and then see what like comes out. You know, my first degrees in conceptual photography and I loved just watching the imagery kind of come alive in the developer. Mm -hmm. And I do the same with painting in many ways, but that's me. I don't have a preconceived idea beforehand. And so those that do have that like image you're working from Irene, there are ways to kind of get you more into that intuitive stance, right? You probably are like, oh, I'm now, I'm flowing in the abstract because I'm capturing the essence of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I do is I do, uh, people call it different things. I start with the background, laying down a collage and all kinds of colors and patterns. And then I deal with the image on top of that. Yeah, it's a way to create that sense of history and that sense mm -hmm. of texture, correct? Yeah, yeah, I love texture. Yeah, I do too. I do too. So sometimes the painting has a surprise for me um, and, and it's not me having to be at the helm all the time and I'm able to like <laughs> take those cues. And I think that's how I got into the geometric shapes with the atmosphere. It wasn't planned beforehand. It was me being in the studio and doing hours and hours and hours of paintings that weren't quite working. And then sometimes you get that aha moment. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's good. Okay. Um, <laughs> anything else? Or are we good here? What, do, what questions do you think someone might want to ask me um, that are thinking of joining up? What, what, what's, um, I have one. What, what do you, how do you envision um, the first meeting with the mentorship group? What typically would happen? Well, we're going to do introductions, kind of say who we are and, and not talk about the commercialism of art, talk about what a passion. And that way we have those words to work with. And I'm going to do some prompts with words and a whole idea generating. And then after the end of that first class, we'll have an image that we chose that we'll be working with and that you'll be working with for the month. And we'll either close or open with a with a creative visualization meditation just for inspiration. And hopefully, you know, it's recorded so people can go back to it to get themselves into the zone. That's how yes, they are. They are recorded and they're in um, each member's library. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really about changing and shifting our perception. You know, if we have an apple and we're looking at the apple and we turn it the other way, it looks different. And sometimes we don't know it, especially as beginning artists, we're stuck on one way. We think oh, it needs to be done this way, or I made a good painting like this, so I'm going to keep making a painting like this, or I have an idea for a body of work. And I'm here a little sometimes as a coyote interrupter to get you to think of it <laughs> differently so you can make your best work. And uh -huh. if you're if you're trying to like do something representational and it's not working, it's not working, you know, I don't know how to do it. Well, it's sort of like if you were to draw a hand over and over and over and over and over again, it then becomes your way of making a hand. Yeah. It's like... Uh, there's on this masters, there are many masters that one can go to, to learn the drafting drawing skills. Right. And then, then there's that other side of, let me just, sometimes it's uncomfortable. We think we need this whole left brain, but I really feel like the feeling will get us into the right way to make it. Does that make sense? I, yeah. it's, it's hard to explain in words because I see it happen all the time. You know, people get, get into their fear and now we're learning not to push away the fear, but say, Hey, come on in. You know, you want to work with me? This is what I'm doing. I'm in command here and the painting is in <laughs> command, but you fear your, you fourth thing over there. Just, uh, where is it? Is it in my throat communication? Is it in my heart? Is it in my belly? You know, that way you can soften the knots and make your, your 
your painting experience so much better, um, especially for all women out there. A lot of us women are perfectionists and we have this vision of what the painting should look like. And sometimes it does and it doesn't, but how can we get to that place of this is you, this is how you you work. Let's, let's look at all the components that are working and mm -hmm. like concentrate on that and see if we can develop that to finish pieces that you really like. Doesn't happen overnight. We all put in our 10,000 hours, no matter who we are. Yes. Um, I am, I am just taking all of this in and so excited to um, be involved in your group, Lauren, and I look forward to a launch later this month and being your navigator. And um, I, I have Irene on the fall call. If you were, if you were oh, doing sure. something with a, with a painter, like you see what I do and what I do, what would you want? Just out of curiosity, yep. what would you want to see happen in a, if you saw me and you're, you're like, okay, she does this, this is how she does that. What might you ask? Hmm. Um, I guess I am really open to different ways of um exploring the medium um getting started uh you know like what you said if you turn an apple a different way it looks different um so i'm, I'm really open to that and, and and getting feedback and ideas about different ways of looking at things oh that's wonderful yeah that's what I, yeah that's what i do <laughs> I don't know. This whole art process is not about being comfortable, right? I mean, I guess it is if we're drafting and we're making something really to look like something. But even that, you know, I believe art is the technical expertise adequate enough to produce an emotional impact. And so how do we how do we find that individual way of doing something that's representational that expresses us? And we have to ask a lot of questions of us, you know. I have recently had the experience of showing uh, my, what I call my new art and the response in the shows has been fantastic. Like people get it and they wanted to talk to me about what it meant to them. Oh, wonderful. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it's the most wonderful feeling I've ever had. Congratulations. Yes, Irene, congratulations. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you're still exploring. Oh, gosh, I... yes. <laughs> it's a lifetime of exploration, I'll tell you that. Do you have your work in your IG, I Irene? Yes I, yes, I do. I haven't posted in a little while. I've suffered a health issues, but yes, I do. Yeah. If you'd like to share your IG in the chat, I would love to go look at it to see okay. what's there. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, during during the uh, course of the month, we we meet with Lauren twice. And that is on the fourth Monday of every month. And then mid-month, um, we have a meeting with the members and myself. And um, I'm just jotting down your um, thank you for that. Sure. Um, we meet during um, the month halfway through and discuss whatever we want to talk about in terms of, you know, the last session, questions that bubbled up for us uh, to maybe present what it is that we're doing um, within, you know, just the, the members group. That's always a great thing. Um, and over the course of weeks, we develop into and morph into 
um, what is the best thing for us because it really is our community and uh, it's it's our group and we're we're gonna we're gonna coalesce and and uh, support one another and be each other's cheerleaders and uh, it's such a good thing I have enjoyed mentorship very very much and Irene thank you for your your IG. Oh, you're welcome. And it's been lovely to meet both of you. Thank you for putting this on. They're always so interesting. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And um, if you're watching this later on Mastery is uh, YouTube, um, to join Lauren's group, you can go to masteries.com, select um, your mentor, and choose Lauren Manticon, and it will take you to her uh, mentorship group where you can enroll. And you can always uh, ask a question in community, how to do that, numerous ways to get in touch with us. So with that, I think we have reached a conclusion this afternoon. And thank you so much. You're welcome uh, so much for a great Meet the Mentor. It has been fascinating, enlightening, and inspiring. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you both. Thank you for joining us, Irene.